This is Smarter San Diego TV. Ever considered Pinterest for staging your home? Well, our next guests are going to tell you how it can help. We always stage our properties. We feel that staging really, really helps out with the sale of a property. She's wonderful, and um, I would recommend her to anybody, I mean, any real family. Please give a warm welcome to the co-founder of Tilton King Real Estate, Katie King, and her guest, home stager, Janicia Secre. All right, here they are. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome Thanks. back. Of course, Katie. Thank you. The king. The king. Is back. <laughs> the one and only. She's back. And you brought a very special friend yes, today I did. on the show. Tell us about Genesia. Yeah, this is Genesia. Um, she is our stager that does all of our homes when we um, sell properties. We always stage our properties. Once in a while, you'll have a home that doesn't, you know, the clients don't want you to stage or for whatever reason, but she does all of our staging. We feel that staging really, really helps out with the sale of a property. She's wonderful, and um, I would recommend her to anybody I meet, any realtor I meet, or non realtor. Yeah, anyone. anybody. Anyone. Anybody that <laughs> needs help. Any I've, I've, I've um, yeah, <laughs> I referred her to a client that we had that just needed help at help designing and just getting a, an idea of how to set up their house after the sale of the home. So cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, and we're going to weave Pinterest into this conversation, which mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. I'm, I'm not a pinter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no FOMO. Me either. <laughs> Uh, FOMO means fear missing out for those of you who don't know. Um, uh, so, <laughs> but you know, it's I've no I've heard a lot of good things about it, especially yeah. in the design world, which mm -hmm. is basically what you're doing when you're staging a home, right? You're like right. You're, you're designing mm -hmm. it for a short period of time, mm -hmm. so that people can see like, hey, this is, might be what it could look like if you came right. in here and brought your stuff in, mm -hmm. um, or what it would look like if you went and you got new furniture and you set this place up and made it look right. really spiffy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is helpful in the sale of a home. So of we'll course. get to Pinterest mm -hmm. in a second, but. I want to talk about you know the the kind like what you what you do when you go to stage a home. In other words, like you walk in. What are the things mm -hmm. that you're looking for? What are the things that you're trying to get rid of? Mm -hmm. And what things are you trying to introduce to the home to help appeal to the buyers? Okay. Usually, um, what I do when I walk into a home, I walk with the uh, the homeowner, and we just do a walkthrough throughout the whole house. And then afterwards, I kind of come back and I tell them, and I speak with usually the agents with this also. And we might discuss things like decluttering, um, needing to depersonalize the house. A lot of times, most people have a lot of pictures, you know, up on the walls. So we want to kind of take down that type of stuff, you know, that might, you know, uh, we want to try to make it feel like not such um, a lived-in space, mm -hmm. but something that's more neutral so that we can um, appeal to the, the most potential buyers that'll um, walk through the house. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you do something like that? I mean, is it just basically about sort of resetting, trying to make it look brand new? As a put, like, is that the idea? Because brand new um, would be the only way it would look non-lived in, right? So is that the direction yeah, you try to go with it? Most of the time. So it just really depends on the house. Some some uh, homeowners already have a nicely decorated home, but it might be a little bit maybe bland. Mm -hmm. So I might come in and just add, you know, a few pops of colors. Um, or home organization is really important that I, um, you know, try to stress to clients uh, when when people walk through the house, if they have, um, they want to look through closets, they want to look through, you know, kitchen cabinets, stuff like that. So I think organizations um, a real very important thing. And also, if a house has um, too much furniture in a small space, then that's something that um, I try to always address right away and, and, you know, let them know we need to, you know, remove this big comfy accent chair. I know that they love it, but it's something that really will um, make the room feel smaller and it just takes up so much space. So, so a lot of like things like that that I look for to try to help them to just maximize the space. I can totally relate to that. Yeah. Uh, doing our reality show, Win This Listing, which Somebody's going to oh, be on cool. this week. Yes. The, the next episode we're shooting in a couple of days, you're going to be know, on, yes. which is going to be awesome. One of the things I've noticed in going into these houses a lot of times is that people seem to use every square inch mm -hmm. to put a piece of furniture in. Right. Once they've lived in a place long enough, mm -hmm. you know, you make enough trips to Target and Costco, <laughs> and you're going to find <laughs> some, a place to put this right. stuff, right? Exactly. <clears throat> these places are so packed with stuff, and we're mm -hmm. trying to come in with lights and cameras and tripods and mm -hmm. all this stuff. So I totally get the cluttered thing, and it, yeah. makes, it makes the house look smaller. Mm -hmm. For showings, that's no good, right, Katie? Right, right. I mean, I, I feel like when I am showing properties, buyers 
have a lot of feedback and they have a lot of opinions. And when I go in and show a home, I mean, on either side, but as a buyer's agent, I go in and, you know, I get, do get a lot of feedback of like, oh, why would they use, I mean, people are people. They're going to be looking at furniture. They're going to be looking at things in the house. That's just how we are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, they're going to notice things like that. But when we come in with a fresh eye and we see the buyers can see how they can envision their home and how they would be living. Mm -hmm. It's it's huge. Yeah. I, I feel like I get a lot better feedback when I'm showing a home that's staged, whether it's my listing or someone else's. Okay. Yeah. That Especially makes sense. with online mm -hmm. photos. So most people are, you know, initially looking online mm -hmm. and if you have a house that's just so cluttered with with stuff um, when it photographs the first thing that someone when they're searching they're gonna see just you know well that square footage is just too that house is too tiny for me and they just move on mm -hmm. so ideally um, you want to stage that property before um, it goes on the market because you're gonna your chances um, are gonna increase it's like 23 um, 23 days that it'll spend on the market mm -hmm. versus like 128 days if mm -hmm. you list it before it's staged. Interesting. So mm -hmm. it's just a really, really important to have it decluttered as mm -hmm. open as possible um, before you before you get it on the market. So yeah. how does how does yeah. Pinterest play a role in you know maybe what you do or what or what other people are looking for? Because I'm mm -hmm. assuming that you know home buyers might be people who are looking on Pinterest and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So they might be expecting to see certain mm -hmm. things or maybe if you show them things they've seen on Pinterest, they might think it's cooler. I mean, does that does it really have that much of an effect on uh, um, the staging process? I think that, I think Pinterest is good for people that already have an eye kind of for decorating and stuff like that. They might be able to utilize that better than the average person. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that I would recommend that most people um, hire a stager at least for a consultation. And then that way they will give them, you know, the, the very first um, tools that they really need, like, um, like I mentioned, decluttering, organizing, um, that type of stuff. And then from there, if the, um, once the, the homeowner gets a general idea of what needs to be done, um, then they can go on Pinterest and then get little tips and tricks on like maybe where to uh, how to do a floral arrangement or um, You know how to decorate a console table to make it feel a little bit more lively and and brighten up the space Yeah, and all those little things can add up. Yeah. You know, is what yeah, is basically what it boils down to mm -hmm. what do you say? <coughs> I'm just gonna go back to King here for a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if We're in a hot market Mm -hmm. which a lot of people say we, we are still in, even though we're headed here in the, deep in the fourth quarter now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need to stage my home. Why would I stage my home when the market's so hot that people are, are knocking on my door asking to buy it and I don't even have it for sale? Um, what would you say to someone who is trying to talk you out of the staging? No one's going to talk me out of staging. The reason why is because Rebecca and I, we pay for it. So most of the time, <laughs> so that's your answer. No FOMO. <laughs> I'm giving away some of our little secrets of, of why we get listings, but um, we pay for it. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, people aren't going to say, now I've had one or two where people are still living in there where they say, you know, we have a dog or mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. And um, she has worked magic. And she has said, well, why don't we go ahead and implement some colors over here? Take this cow. I mean, very simple things. But... It is a ben only a benefit to people to stage their prop property because A, it's going to make it look better. It's going to give it vision for others to see what they can do with their home. And it's all around just more attractive. I, I took some of the statistics from online and there was something that I read and I'm really bad at memorizing, <laughs> so I needed to read it. But according to U.S. Housing and Urban Development, um, a staged home will sell 17% higher than a comparable home that is not staged. 17%. 17% mm. higher. <clears throat> so when I say we will pay for it, that's great. But when I say it's gonna sell for more because people are gonna come in and wanna pay more for a property, I sure as heck would want to. When I go into a property and I see that it's done and it's mm -hmm. beautiful and it's the TV would go here and the couch would go here and it's just all compliment, I mean, it just looks great. Mm -hmm. um, I have more of a of an inkling to want to you know, push that property as far as even me buying it. Wow. So can we say that if anyone out there wants to list their home with you, 
you guys will pay for it. We're paying for it. <laughs> yeah. Give me the bill. Uh, well. I'll send it to her. <laughs> She'll take the check. <laughs> I literally. That's huge. <laughs> That's a huge value. It is a huge value. And and a lot of agents actually do not pay or they don't pay for staging. Mm-hmm. So they'll they'll charge the commission and then they'll say, great, this is why. And every, every agent's going to agree that staging helps sell a property and for more. That's given. Mm-hmm. We have the statistics. We have the proof. Mm-hmm. And, and sellers and buyers alike agree as well. So the, the issue that we have is, okay, well, who pays for that? And, and why, where's the motivation to do it? And that's when we say, pick me. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll do it. Mm-hmm. We'll make it look great. Mm-hmm. She'll make it look great. And I'll pick up the tab. Yeah. <laughs> well. I mean, come on. I just, you know, no better way to end the segment, I think, than that. Yeah. I mean, hey, yeah. if you want to sell your home for more, staging has been proven yeah. to be one of the things right. that will help you do that no matter what kind of home you have, no matter what kind of neighborhood you are in. Mm-hmm. And you get it for free. Well, Tilton King Real Estate. So, <laughs> Come on. I mean, you can't argue with free. Nothing's for free these yeah. days. Nothing's for free. That's free. That's actually free. Right. Great stuff. Thank you guys so much for coming. Really yeah. appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank it's you. great to have you. Thank you. Stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else. Commercial mm-hmm. free. No FOMO. <laughs> Buying and selling a home can be very stressful and there is nothing worse than falling out of escrow. Our next guests are going to show you how to avoid that problem. So when the home warranty company comes out, they're probably not going to fix it. That the seller is ready for them as opposed to what's going on, you know, how come this is happening? Please welcome Realtors with Remax Associates, Trisha Daly and Judy Bramer. Here they are, Trish <laughs> and Judy. As you've seen on <laughs> bus benches around San Here Diego we County, uh, wearing the same garb too. So we got you guys figured out, huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah, this is our uniform. Your so. uniforms. <laughs> got the unis on. It's great to have you guys here uh, today. This today, I think a lot of people are going to be interested in this information. Not just home buyers and home sellers, but potentially other people in your industry as well. Because today is all about how not to screw up in escrow. And this happens all the time. I don't know what the stats are, but at one point I remember hearing that one in four transactions was falling out of escrow. Wow. That's what I heard. I'd have to find a new job. Right? (laughs) 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 If that were were really happening, and maybe this was skewed because it was a certain time, but I I know that it's something that people have experienced out there. They know what Mm -hmm. it's like to write an offer on a house, have that offer accepted, but then ultimately not end up getting it. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of different reasons why that can happen. So I think one of the things we want to talk about today is, you know, what does the process look like? How can people be smart on both sides? So who wants to talk about the process? Trish? Trish? Well, <laughs> I, I think um, to start out with, uh, are we talking about buyers or sellers? Um, well, let's talk about from the selling standpoint, because that's where it really begins, right? So someone's got to list their home for sale. Correct. Let's go all the way back to that. Okay. Well, um, when we start with a listing, it's important that people prep their houses so that they show in their best light. So if that means doing some staging, getting a gardener, clean up the yard, uh, and get it ready and put it on the market. And then marketing. Marketing is very important too. You have to, uh, we have a professional photographer go out and take photos. And then once uh, it goes on the market, then make sure that the house is ready every single moment of the day because you never know when the buyer is going to come through. Then once you get into um, escrow, it's negotiating the offers. So there may be just one offer you're working with or you may have three or four multiple offers. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, And step in any time, (laughs) Judy. I'm waiting for a break. (laughs) Okay. Um, But that's where it gets a little tricky. So when we get multiple offers or even just one offer, the first thing we do is we call the lender and we double check that the buyer is qualified to purchase. We also uh, request... Which is the first step in making sure that it doesn't fall out of escrow, which is the point here because making sure the buyer is truly qualified, a lot of times it's that loan contingency yes. that you know causes these things to fall out of escrow and it can really screw things up. So I think I just want to mention, point out that you calling, taking the initiative to call a lender, I can't believe when I hear that these the deals fall out because of lending and non-qualification because it's that call that didn't take place. That's correct. That causes that. Yep. So I wanted to mention that. Yep. And then, so we always get proof of funds and we talk to the lender to verify their credibility and their um, every that all of their um, 
their monies have been checked and they've been on their job long enough. And then we also check on the agent that's bringing the offer to see how many years they're in the business and what their, you know, yeah. experience and, and is. The, it's a little investigative Yeah, work. and the yeah. importance of doing that is so that we can let the seller know, you know, you're dealing with an experienced agent or maybe you're dealing with somebody that's a little green and there may be some hiccups so that when those hiccups come that the seller is ready for them as opposed to what's going on you know how come this is happening so we're we're actually doing some education with the uh, with the agent a lot of times when we've got some green agents mm -hmm. but we know that up front and our seller knows that yeah so we're able to kind of keep things moving along mm -hmm. that information you know. is powerful because you yeah. do know that you need to have your, your guard up a little more in some cases where other cases you someone you worked with 10 20 times before you go and yeah, these people know what they're doing yeah everything mm -hmm. should be good to go mm -hmm. uh, but either way at some point you've got to select an offer to accept right correct yeah so once you accept that offer this is for people out there who don't know this is when you go into escrow Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that, that is yeah. when that is when you enter escrow when mm -hmm. that offer is accepted. Now we have an agreement. Both sides agree this is the price, and we're now going to march down the path of making this happen. Yeah. It's not as simple as just, hey, we both agree, we're selling for five fifty, they want to buy for five fifty, <laughs> call it a day. You know, no. it's not it's not like buying something at Walmart. Okay, you can't just swipe yeah. your credit card and walk through. Yeah. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's why we have to go into this escrow period. Mm -hmm. That's why it exists, so that we can figure out the exchange of money who's lending what, make sure all the assets are, are tied together properly, titles held properly, all that stuff. So falling out of escrow is what we're trying to avoid. Yes. So let's so talk about the, the what two, causes that. The two primary uh, areas that things fall out of escrow is either because of the appraisal, because the appraisal didn't come in on value, or because something happened with the inspection that scared off the buyer. Okay. You know, so, so the first thing we do is we you know, what Trish and I do is we ask for the appraisal to be ordered within the first three days of escrow. So that way we know it's going to be done timely and we ask the seller to make sure they keep the house in tip-top condition, show condition. You know, it doesn't matter if it's the appraiser, doesn't matter if it's the inspector, somebody's coming and looking at the house. So, so you want the house to still look good. And we ask the seller to provide us with an amenities list, everything they've done to the house to upgrade it, you know, mm -hmm. new windows, new roof, the heater, things that the appraiser might not see, and provide a list of that to the appraiser. We also provide comps to the appraiser if the appraiser, you know, would like us to provide comps, especially if it's in and around our neighborhood. Uh, Trish and I do a lot of business in Claremont, Bay Park, and so, so we can more easily mm -hmm. provide comps to maybe an appraiser that doesn't work in the neighborhood quite so much. So that's, that's the first thing is, is, you know, doing that and providing that to the appraiser and making sure that process keeps moving. Are we still having issues yeah. with out of area appraisers really not knowing what's going on? I know that was a big deal for a while. Is that something that's still an issue? It's not so bad now, um, but it was the big deal back in 2008 and 2009 because appraisers were coming in from Riverside and trying to appraise Claremont or try to appraise um, Mount Helix and the appraisals weren't coming in. They were coming in lower because they weren't familiar with our area. Gotcha, okay, yeah. so it's good to know that that's not as big of an issue now. It's not, it's not as big an issue, but no. we still like to provide those comps, you know, comparable properties so to the appraisers. Appraisals and yeah. inspections, yeah. they're number, the number one and number two things. On the inspection side, just curious, do you guys think that a pretty listing inspection is wise for a home seller to do if they have an older home that might have a few issues? We don't like to do that because if you do a pre-listing inspection, then that inspection report needs to go to the buyer. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And if it's something that isn't that big of a deal, now the buyer may think it is a big deal. You know, and why didn't the seller fix this in advance? Mm -hmm. You know, most sellers know what's going on with their home and what things need to be repaired. And so we ask for any of those things that they're aware of to be taken care of in advance. Tighten up those those faucets that are loose and you know, make sure you're not having any, any outside faucets dripping mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the blinds that don't work well, get those fixed or get those repaired. You know. mm -hmm. But if you do an inspection, sometimes those come back to, to bite you. Okay, you know, they can. Let the, let the buyer do their own inspection and decide what's important for them and what's not. Okay. Yeah. Plus, the, if the seller does an inspection, that inspection report does not belong to the buyer. Right. So, say for instance a seller does do an inspection and the buyer doesn't do their own inspection 
and they move in and there's a home inspection uh, or a home per, uh, warranty on the house and the dishwasher goes out. Well, that inspection report does not belong to that buyer. So mm -hmm. when the home warranty company comes out, they're probably not gonna fix it. Gotcha, okay, makes sense. I was just curious yeah. um, if that's one of the, the top reasons. So what are the things that, let's say, either buyers or, or sellers could do to help avoid some of these things that cause uh, people to fall out of escrow and deals to break up? Well, the first thing we suggest is be flexible. Is if you're in a multiple offer situation and you know the price is here and you and the the offer's been bid up and you accept a higher offer, the buyer more than likely is going to want something to come back to them. You know they're going to want some kind of a credit. You know and so you know you go in and you do the inspection and if you and if you'd accept an offer maybe that was at listing price. Maybe the buyer would be fine with, I'll take care of that, I can take care of that. But it's like, you know, I paid $10,000 more. I want a little bit back. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to be asking for a few more things. So we just ask the, the sellers, just be flexible with this. And then, you know, but when we do get the inspection report uh, and we get the request for repairs, we'll talk to the uh, buyer's agent about it. You know, what's going on, what's really important for the buyer. So we know what the hot buttons are. We'll review the inspection report and then we'll sit down with the, with the seller. It's about communication, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that everybody's on the same page. Yeah. I think another thing too, uh, in addition to that, is that um, as soon as we list a house, we get the sellers to complete the disclosures. And as soon as we open escrow, we get those completed disclosures to the buyer immediately. Because <clears throat> they have a certain amount of days to review the disclosures, and if there's something on there, a title, disclosure or something, then that gives the buyer time to jump on the, their investigation and do their due diligence to find out what the item might be that brings up questions. Okay, makes sense. Well, I think that uh, one of the things that's a lot of people who are not familiar with the industry will realize is that if they, if they think about it, they get worked up over little things. Mm -hmm. I mean, how mm -hmm. many times have you seen someone, you know, ready to walk away from a deal over a thousand bucks or something yes. like that. Yes. I mean, just <laughs> crazy emotion. So when you say be flexible, I'm actually going to say hashtag calm down. <laughs> okay, <Yes. laughs> like, just calm down. Okay, just because it's you got to realize what you're giving up and like yeah. all this thing. Because let's now talk about what happens if you fall out. So if you do decide to get hard headed over some small stuff, or even something that may seem big like two thousand um, bucks. Yeah. Now, what are the consequences of that? How many more mortgage payments do you have to make? How much are you going to mm -hmm. miss out on? How, how does your property look now that you have to go out there and market it as back on the market? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what statement and, does that cost? And those are, uh, I was going to actually bring that up about, you know, talking to the seller and saying, so what happens if you don't provide this $2,000 credit? You know, where do you want to go? You know, let's keep the big picture in mind. You know, why are you selling the house and where, and where is it that you're going? And it's like, oh, that's right. I've got this job in North Carolina. I need to sell the house. I can't afford to have a rent payment there and have the house payment here. You're right, let's just make this deal happen and go. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, you know, like I said, just keeping those lines of communication open. Yeah, you don't want to yeah. have to remarket a property. You want to yeah. have to go back through the whole process. Yeah, it's know? pretty negative going back on the market. Yeah. That's yeah. not so a good thing. Yeah. And, and part of that too is properly pricing a property. So you have to properly price a property and, and the more, it's a numbers game. So the more buyers you have coming in, the closer you are going to get to a, a uh, go into escrow. Right. Well, I hopefully I wish this upon no one that your <laughs> your deal falls out of escrow. But should it start to look that way, or if it should happen, now you at least know what to do. Thank you guys so much for coming today. Really appreciate your time. Good. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Thank great you. Thank you. Both. Trish yeah. and Judy, stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else, commercial free. Homes come and go very quickly on the San Diego market, leaving buyers to wonder what they can get. Not to worry, our next guests are going to share with you how to get a bigger home. The, the unknown is the biggest fear for people when they're buying and selling a home. Can I buy or 
and then sell? Do I need to sell and then buy? Can I do both at the same time? A lot of people just aren't aware that all three of those options are available. Please welcome Santee real estate expert, Daniel Buxa, and sales manager for Mission Federal Credit Union, Dan Help. There they are. Hey. hey. All right. Thank you, you. Dan and Dan, Daniel and Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you guys back on the show. Um, hot topic today, which is uh, something that a lot of people are trying to figure out what to do with. You know, like you bought a house, you have equity now, or maybe the home values have gone up, or maybe it's just time. Maybe you bought three, four, five years ago when the market was depressed and you weren't even trying to time the market, you just got lucky. Yeah. And now you've got all this equity and you want to move into a bigger house. The family's growing, um, you have different needs now than you had before. But a very scary proposition for people who have never bought and sold a home at the same time before, uh, or people who maybe ha have, but it's been a decade or more since something like that has happened. So you guys are doing now with Mission Fed, you guys are doing these, these seminars to show people, and I know Daniel, you wanted to bring Dan on today specifically because you're one of the real estate partners with Mission Fed, to talk about how you're helping people go through this process. Yeah, most definitely. Actually, we started building this product uh, earlier in the year. I reached out to Daniel and said, hey, listen, we've seen a whole segment of our membership that have bought homes, and they're really kind of wondering what the next step is if they want to sell in the market. And I said, this is a great opportunity for us to educate and provide a service to our membership, which is always huge with Mission Fed. And so uh, he, of course, was 100% on board. That's what I love working about with Daniel, is that he is always ready to um, educate and serve the folks that he works with. And we wanted to give him an opportunity to learn something about what is the challenges you're going to face when you're selling a home and moving up to your next home in San Diego. So what are some of those things, Daniel? Let's talk about it. Because I mean, I, I know a lot of people who have equity now, and then they feel like they're in a catch-22 a little bit. They say, you know, I have equity, but prices are up. I want to move up, but prices are up there as well. So I feel like I'm not getting as much for my equity. Or, you know, a lot of people thinking a lot of different things. How would you educate somebody who's, who's timed the market, right, has that equity, and it's time for them to move up? I think you really hit it on the head. The, the unknown is the biggest fear for people when they're buying and selling a home really just educating them on the process as far as how do the numbers break down on selling a home as well as the financing and programs available for them on the buy side. So that's one of the big reasons I like partnering with Mission Federal Credit Union is that their members trust them because they're doing what's right for their members. And I feel people when they're looking at buying and selling and doing such a big transaction, they want to work with people that they trust and that they know are going to treat them like family. So. That's why I partner with Mission Federal Credit Union, and that's why I'm so excited to do this Move Up seminar with them because who else would you want to partner with? Yeah, and yeah. moving up is something that, if especially for someone who's just bought a home and has never bought and sold a home at the same time, yeah. right? Um, there are there are a lot of more moving parts. I mean, you got twice as many moving parts now, sure, um, as you did when you were just buying this home for the first time. So I think trust is important um, for people to have, but also. Um, Trust in, in what? The process. And that's, I imagine, what you're going to talk about in the centers. Can you give us a little window into what is going to be discussed, a little teaser for Absolutely. what people are going to learn? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So what the, what the seminar is, it's actually more of a hands-on workshop where we are going to give people an idea of what they can sell their home for and how they can leverage that equity into their new home purchase. And instead of having them come and show up and us lecture to them for an hour, we're actually going to provide them real estate professionals from a realtor like Daniel Buxa to having somebody that can talk to them about taxes, somebody that can talk to them about making home improvements and give them all the resources they need to help them get over that fear and make the decision about what do I need to do and how does it look, right? What do I need to do? Can I buy and then sell? Do I need to sell and then buy? Can I do both at the same time? A lot of people just aren't aware that all three of those options are available. Very, very good point. Yeah, and they are very different yep. processes completely. So yeah. you really need to know which one you're getting into and which one you qualify for. Because right. you may not be able to buy and then sell if you don't properly qualify for both mortgages, right? On exactly. the lending side. Yeah. So, so that's a key one. Uh, I'm gonna also kind of give people a little idea on the math and how it works because I think people get stuck thinking, well, you know, my house went up in value, but so are all the houses up here. And so I feel like I'm not getting anything from equity. You are getting something for your equity. You're getting cold hard cash for your equity. Okay? Oh, yeah. Especially yeah. if you've been in your house for two <laughs> years or more yeah. and you've lived there the whole time, you're getting uh, capital gains free money that you can use towards the down payment on your next house. So for example, you buy a house for 400000 It goes up to 500000 using simple math. You bought it FHA. You put very little money down. You had mortgage insurance that whole time. Now you have 100000 that you can put down to on a million-dollar house if you want 10% down. Sure. So you're going to pay less 
of right. a percentage in, in mortgage insurance there on a bigger loan amount, but you will have, you'll have more leverage on that buy side now to be able to put that big down payment. Maybe you've got enough to even put 20% down on, you know, enough equity to put 20% down on the new purchase, even though you're buying a bigger home and have no mortgage insurance. Right. So there's, there's things that you can do. That's, I think, what you meant when you say leverage the equity. Yeah. Take the equity, leverage it to help you get into a, a better financial circumstance on the mortgage side, which, although you may be uh, buying a bigger place and your payment may be going up, more of that payment may be meet and less of it may be mortgage exactly. insurance. You're attacking like the that. principal and the interest on the payment instead of mortgage insurance. So definitely. A lot of times the payment is very similar when you're moving up. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that weird how that works out? Yeah. But I think people get stuck with the, the, the sticker price. They start looking, they're just looking at the values of the home and you forget how to leverage your equity. So that's where the financing really comes in. And I think you'll be able to do a good job of, of showing that to people in these seminars, that this is something that you can use this to your advantage now. It's not an even trade. Exactly. We actually provide them with a personalized package that breaks down what they can sell their home for and then what they could qualify to buy so they know exactly what price range they're shopping in. And then they have payments they can compare to what was I paying then and what am I going to be paying now? And they can see the similarity and then it takes, like Daniel said, some of the fear of making that decision out and we just want to provide that through education. Very cool. I think you made a really good point. It's like everyone's scenario is a little bit different too. And that's one of the great things about doing a workshop is Everyone's going to have a different story in a different situation. Maybe someone needs to renovate a kitchen or a bathroom to sell their home for top dollar. What does that process look like? Um, some people might have two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars of equity, and how does that affect the buy side? Um, are they going to pay off some debts that have been weighing them down over the years, as well as put a down payment down? So. I think a workshop's really good where you can kind of tailor it to each individual yeah. and do what's best for them, not just a set program for everyone. And when, Daniel, on the real estate side, when we're in a market like we're in right now and someone does have equity and, and inventory is very low. Right. And it, it may seem, it may be true that selling the home will be an easier process than buying the home. I, don't know, I, I use the word easy very loosely. <laughs> But let's say that the, the buy side is more of the challenging aspect. Sure. And perhaps people who have even looked online or maybe even done a little kicking around have found that to be the case. Um, how would you put them at ease with the, just the idea, the concept of going in this direction in this market? It's a great question. So I would say one of the things that I notice is typically certain price ranges, you're going to have a lot more demand. For me, when I'm selling in that four to $500,000 range, um, homes are flying like hotcakes, but when people are buying in seven, eight hundred thousand dollar price ranges, it's a different demographic, and it's easier for buyers to buy those homes. Um, so people who are doing move up, mm. I think this is a great opportunity because you're getting the better end of both sides, where your home's selling like a hotcake, and you have more leverage on your buy side as well as low interest rates. Yeah, um, I think it's a perfect storm for being able to help people buy and sell homes and really accomplish those dreams. So that's what we like to do is kind of break it down, educate people and make their dreams come true. Really good point. Yeah, the higher you move up in the price scale, yeah. the less competition that there is. Yeah, absolutely. So if you are a move up buyer, chances are you're gonna have a lot of activity on your sell side right. and a lot less competition on your buy side. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It makes perfect sense. I didn't even think about that, but yeah. it's true. Yeah, yeah. especially that, you know, if you're looking in that seven, $800,000 range, mm -hmm. um, you'll have a lot, a lot of, to choose from. Right. have a lot of options. Yeah. Just selling a lot of homes, I see that personally where the seven, $800,000 homes take longer to sell. There's longer days on market. So um, I really think it puts those clients in a really good position. Obviously, Mission Fed, Daniel, you guys are doing a, a lot of um, a lot of things for them, not just mortgages. You guys are providing a tremendous amount of service to, to your members. Yeah. Um, but this happens to just be that one big thing you know, for everybody. This is that really important one big thing where uh, the proper guidance can make a big difference for people. So you want to extend out to the members the opportunity to give them some great guidance on a, a really big decision that they're making here. Yeah, I mean, buying a home is, is usually the biggest uh, transaction that folks are going to make from a financial standpoint. And then when you're selling and buying, it can seem a little bit overwhelming. And uh, we just want to give them as much education as we can. And like you had mentioned, with rates being as low as they are right now, it's still a great time to buy a home. Yeah, absolutely. They can definitely leverage their equity and leverage the low interest rates and, of course, leverage their relationship and membership with Mission Fed. Yeah.
Perfect stuff. Thank yep. you guys so much for coming today. Really Thank appreciate you. your awesome. time. Thank Great you for time. having Thank us. You. Appreciate it, Derek. Stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else. Commercial free. Next up on the yellow couch, we have a couple of gents representing Scripps Ranch. Yes, exactly, because everybody's going to have a different different risk tolerance and, mm -hmm. and where they are in life, whether you're trying to build your wealth or trying to protect it. You know, I've given this advice before, make sure your house is turnkey and price it right. Because those same 47 homes that have been sitting on the market, a lot of those have been sitting on for an extended period of time. Please welcome expert Scott Ryan and his guest, the owner of JBL Wealth Strategies, John Latrullo. All right, Scripps Ranch is in the house. <laughs> Hashtag Scripps Ranch. That's right. <laughs> great to have you guys here, Scotty. Great to have you back. Thank you. Uh, John, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Um, big topics today, macroeconomic stuff, investments, real estate. Uh, Scotty, tell me why you wanted to bring John on. Well, John and I, our kids go to school together. We're friends in Scripps Ranch. And, you know, I think being a real estate agent, you get the question all the time, you know, what's going on with the financial markets as well? And how is that going to affect real estate? So I thought it'd be great to bring on an expert who knows a lot about that stuff to talk about how we can diversify. You know, it's great having real estate investments, but you got to have other vehicles that are going to, you know, earn your money over the long term. So bringing John on, I thought, you know, a local Scripps Ranch guy, somebody who uh, we can all identify with, it would be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. John, I mean, uh, a lot going on right now. Um, you know, we've <laughs> we, we know who our next president is going to be now. Um, people have probably been waiting a lot for that. Have you noticed? I mean, the markets have been sideways for a while, um, and that typically kind of lulls people to sleep with it. You know, if the 401k statement doesn't change drastically one way or the other, people are kind of just meh, you know, about it. Mm -hmm. What kind of guidance um, and, and what kind of ideas are you are you looking at to give people? Um, who are trying to figure out what, what the, should they do to diversify between real estate, stocks, bonds, et cetera. Right. Well, it's good to, again, the, the diversification is definitely the key for most people. You know, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket. So if you can buy real property, uh, invest in mutual funds and, and stocks, then you're really talking about keeping your, your funds able to make money in different areas. Mm -hmm. And that's key because if things are down at one point, you're able to rebalance into another place, which, 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 which that has been very uh, high, sell out of that, and try to buy in something low. So mm -hmm. that's very key for somebody. And with interest rates where they are right now, short-term interest rates, um, you know, we don't know if the Federal Reserve is going to you know, raise the rates. They're going to eventually do it at some point. They have to. We hope so. Yeah. You, know, you can't <laughs> really keep a low-interest environment yeah. for very long because eventually you're artificially making these stocks and other, other uh, products out there higher than they really are. So you want to be key on that, that if rates do go up, you want to make sure that, that you're diversified enough to cover that. Yeah, especially with, you know, um, you know, we've seen since 2009, and the Dow got down in the mid 6,000s. Yeah. And since then, it's just been kind of a straight march exactly. higher. Exactly. I think it's a great time for people to take a look at this stuff. Right. Go, hey, what do I actually own? You yeah, know? Exactly. What is this? Stuff? What is contained in my portfolio? And what I mean by that is not, oh, I own XYZ Mutual Fund. What does XYZ Mutual Fund own? Yeah. Okay. What are they yeah. buying? Right. Exactly. Because that's what you own. How many people don't know that is mind-boggling to me. Yeah. Um, people can name their funds. If they can, first of all, that's first kudos. Now tell me what you actually own. And a lot of people can't answer that. So right. I think it's a great time to take a look at that right. and say, hey, does this actually align with what my strategy is? Exactly. Because everybody's going to have a different, different risk tolerance and, mm -hmm. and where they are in life, whether you're trying to build your wealth or trying to protect it. Um, it's important that you know that your risk tolerance can take on, if there is losses out there, that you know you have a, a certain amount of time to make up for that as well. Definitely. So good, yeah. I mean, you know, with especially with uh, price earnings ratios being higher now than historical, and you know, we see you know, interest rates are low, which typically causes stock prices to be higher exactly. than they should be. I think that protection side is probably the most important side for a right. lot of people, especially if you've made a lot of money. Exactly. You don't want to give it back. Take some of that off the table and invest in something else that's low. Yeah. That might be a really good idea for people. Yes, exactly. Um, especially if you, if you can consider all the things, tax implications, things like that, talk to your CPA and whatnot. Uh, but in certain cases where you can still pay the long-term gains tax and take profits in this situation because we've had such a long run, that may be a, you know, a really good idea for some people. Definitely. Maybe you diversify into real estate, maybe diversify into other investments. But to take a look at, hey, what do I own? How much money do I have to play with? And how can I be smart about it? Right. Protecting myself. Because one thing we do know, Scotty, is that people got to live somewhere. 
Yeah. And well, there's very little places for people to buy right now. There is. And, you know, and Scripps Ranch is one of those communities where you get a lot of, you're getting a lot of turnover. You get a lot of younger families that are moving into Scripps Ranch. And I think when you're in your early 30s or mid-30s mid and you're buying that first home, you probably haven't started saving too much. You probably got some 401k set from your work or whatever, but you're making that first big purchase, which is your place to live, right? We mm -hmm. all need a place to live. We need that write-off. Uh, the second thing is to go look at how can I save and protect myself for long term with raising a family, having kids. You know, do I have a life insurance policy in place? Do I have long term investments? You know, uh, with a guy like John that can help them out and diversifying and keeping a balanced portfolio. I think it's super important. Yeah, you know? totally agree. Because when you do buy that house, of course, you are living in it. Yeah. But whether you like it or not, it's an investment. <laughs> sure. I mean, whether you like it or not, at some point, you're going to sell that house and you're either going to make money or you aren't. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. So in a situation like that where you're spending money on something that eventually you're going to sell, you're buying something you're eventually going to sell for either a profit or a loss, no matter what, no matter which way you want to look at it, it's, that's investment. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then I don't, a lot of people don't necessarily look at it that way. Um, a lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. And I think you have to, right? Is that part of what you're looking at, John, when you're meeting with people is saying, okay, what are you, what are you doing with your real estate? Um, and, and when do you plan on exiting that? And how does that fit into the overall picture? Yeah, when you're, you're, when you're doing comprehensive planning for folks, you're basically you're tying all assets that they have. Okay. So especially when you're going towards retirement age, you know, are you going to be able to sell your house and downsize? Or are you going to, where do you want to move to? Hopefully they do stay in San Diego or maybe they move to another state. So it ties into, you know, obviously as you go along, budgeting is, is important too for these folks to get to, to retirement. Because owning a home, you know, it does tend to cost some money to own a home as well. So as you get to retirement, you want to make sure that when you do sell it, you do get your profit. And then if you're going to take it to, you know, own it, or excuse me, sell it, put it into another investment account uh, with that money or downsize into another another vehicle, that would be more more towards your goals. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I've, I've been saying forever since back in my talk radio days is that, you know, if you, if you own a house free and clear oh. uh, in retirement, you're going to be okay. Yeah. The you can figure out the rest of it, right? Right. So that's, that's why it's such a big part, why these things work so well together, because you, you want to own a home, and not just own a home as in it's, you're on a title. You want to own a home as in you don't have a payment anymore. Exactly. That's what I mean when I say own a home. Now I don't have a house payment anymore. Now I'm going to be okay. If I put some money aside, I've been smart with my investments, I'm going to be okay. Because that housing payment is always going to be the biggest bill we have to pay every month. Sure. And if that thing goes away eventually, which it can, then you're set. Right, and your cash flow is open to more things that you can do during retirement. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's I think it's it's awesome that you guys are doing that and that you've put that piece together and it's right. more comprehensive than just what's in your you know, brokerage account. Exactly. It's got to be more than that, right? Because there's yeah. just more to it than that. Well, because planning ties, there's a lot of things to planning. I mean, there's not just investments. I mean, like, like Scott mentioned, you know, there's insurance that you need to have to cover your life or discover disability. You have to have an estate plan in place to cover if something happens to you. Um, you have to have uh, education planning in place if you have kids that you want to pay for and for college. So all that ties together and make to make sure that your plan is in, in, on par for what you're looking to do and what your goals are. Yeah, I was surprised. The first time I got a, a real life insurance assessment, I realized how underinsured I was. And I thought I had, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was like, I have 500000 in insurance. That's like a bazillion dollars. Yeah. Um, and then you looked at, okay, well, I only have one child. Yeah. How much money is it going to take to raise her if you were to get by a bus today from now until she's 18 and then pay for college? Right. Yeah. And that number was astounding. Right. So about another million dollars. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and on top of that, you want to take care of your wife who has to pay off the mortgage potentially. There, yeah, yeah. There's yeah, other people involved. Yeah. Yes. So there's a lot of people that need to be taken care of. So you're right. Sure. It is an all-encompassing thing. Yeah. And I think it's awesome uh, that you're looking at all those aspects and the people of Scripps Ranch are lucky to have you there. Yeah. Um, Scotty, if, we can, if I can bend you here, if I can sure. borrow you for a second just to sort of get maybe a wrap-up for how things look uh, in Scripps Ranch real estate-wise. Uh, maybe have a hot listing coming up or something like that? Yeah, we can talk about both. So basically, you know, I ran the numbers this morning and I, I really wanted to see, you know, where we were at from, from two perspectives. One was number of sales from, you know, last year to this year, and then also where our average price is headed. And it's pretty interesting. We had last year 498 sales in scripts. Right now we got 459 closed, but we have 59 pending. Mm. In fact, so we're on track to do probably 20 to 25 more sales this year than, than the previous year. 
Um, the median price right now um, has gone up from about 686 to 697. That's encompassing condos and single family homes. So it's up about one, one and a half percent, which is a good sign. You know, we don't, we want to see slow growth from here on out, given how high the market's gone in the last few years. So slow growth is a good indicator of a healthy market. Unfortunately, we're still having a big you know, shortage of homes for sale. You and I have been talking about this for the latter part of a year. When there's more houses pending than there are for sale, it's, I mean, I checked it this morning, there's 47 homes for sale. <laughs> wow. That's nothing, you know, that's, it's a And how many thousands of homes are there Oh, there's Scripps like 12, 14,000 homes in Scripps Ranch. Yeah. <laughs> the new ones out in Scripps Ranch. I mean, yeah. so right now, if you're a seller, uh, you know, I think we're going to definitely see a good rush in 2017. You know, if I had to forecast what's going to happen next year, uh, we are going to see a higher influx of, of inventory. As long as rates stay somewhat low, I know they're probably going to be raised most likely in December, if I had to guess. And wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree with that? Yes. Even if it's just a tick, you know, historically rates are still going to be somewhat low compared to many years ago. So um, in 2017, I, I forecast another hopefully good, healthy market with slow growth. But if you're a seller, you know, I've given this advice before, make sure your house is turnkey and price it right. Because those same 47 homes that have been sitting on the market, a lot of those have been sitting on for an extended period of time. And there's lots of reasons for that. So. Um, I just represented a buyer, in fact, where the, the list price of the house was eight twenty nine, and it's been on the market for the latter part of five months. They got it for seven fifty two. So think of that—that's an eighty thousand dollar swing in price point from where they started. You know, and if they had priced it probably just under eight to start with, it probably would have sold closer to that number. So mm. um, just things to think about it as a seller. You know, uh, coming up in this in this next year market. So. That's leaving a lot of money on the table, John. Yes, it is. Wow, you, can do, you can do a lot with that money. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're one of those sellers whose home is on the market and has been there for a long time, I know Scotty can't say this, but I'll say, call Scott. Yeah. Your home will not sit around like that. You'll get top dollar for it. Guys, thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Go Scripps Ranch. Stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else commercial free. We are always thrilled about finding new ways to give back to our community. And our next guest is here to share once again a new organization. That talent to bear for young kids to see that there are places for you to go beyond sports and athletics. And then seeing uh, how it is from a business perspective, how the communications exchange back and forth and how negotiations actually work without you know, picking up a gun or wanting to fight someone and so forth. Give a huge welcome to the founder of Military Mutual, Derek Boxdale, and the Vice President of the Eagles organization, Merv Cutler. All right, here they are. Right. What's up, fellas? <laughs> Thank you much. Glad Merv. to be here. Mr. Barksdale, Merv, great to have you on the Good show for the first there. time. Uh, you guys have both served this country. Appreciate your service. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't honor. be here without you. Um, and Derek, now you wanted to bring Merv on today for a very specific reason. Tell us about that. Well, Merv, uh, as you indicated, had served our great nation through the United States Marine Corps. Um, that being said, he's uh, got out of the Marine Corps and uh, now serves through his own for-profit organization where he owns his own company as a disabled veteran. Um, that being said, uh, we have a small group of people, um, 10, 20, 30 people who kind of come together on a monthly basis and meet, have lunch together, and we start realizing some different things that we had in common with one another. One is that we were educated at this point in time. Uh, we are considered successful in our own fields, uh, in our own industries. And uh, we started saying, hey, it's good for us to come together, have some food, break bread with one another, but what can we do for those that are following suit within us? Um, so a guy by the name of Jack Jackson, who was actually an old shipmate of mine by the name of, uh, on the USS Constellation, um, he basically had called me up a while back and said, hey, man, we got this uh, Gathering the Eagles organization. I want you to come be a part of it. So I came in for one, and uh, it kind of started from there. I met with Merv sure. a week after that, and then we said, you know what, we got to start doing something. So uh, I want to just basically expose to the world that uh, we now have a nonprofit organization by the name of the Eagles organization, and uh, I'll let Merv explain a little bit more about it. Tell us about it, Merv. So, so Derek, the Eagles organization, uh, as, as he mentioned before, came together as a gathering of, of, of men that were just having lunches. And as Derek mentioned, we want to do more than just have lunches. And I uh, thought it's time for us to stand up in, a, in an environment today where, where we're seeing a lot of African-American and police 
clashing. Um, there's, there must be something that we can do more than just represent ourselves and have lunch and be great with each other. Um, I think there's, there's a lack of, of, of understanding uh, in our communities of, of who we are and what we do and what we represent. So the Eagles organization will give us a chance uh, to start funneling that information outwards. We don't want to just meet for, with ourselves. We want to actually meet to, to do things to help our communities. And, and by the community, I mean as a whole, not just, not just our inner city youth, but certainly the, the police environments that, that are surround them, that are sworn to protect and serve them, uh, our churches, our, our schools. We want to be involved in that so that they see a positive role model and, and the men that gather together. So that's kind of what we, we said initially we'd start to do. So Awesome. And so what do you see as being some of those things that you're going to try to tackle um, with, you know, the Eagles organization? So, so some of the things that we are initially going to try to tackle is just getting, getting the, since it's just started up, uh, we're going to start getting the folks together, the men together, to start reaching out to, to uh, schools to find, you, you've got organizations like uh, the STEM that's going on nationally, science, technology, engineering, and math, mm -hmm. where you've got a, got a bunch of guys who worked with systems, that, and I could currently work in computer engineering with the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Command. We can bring some of that talent to bear for young kids to see that th there are places for you to go beyond sports and athletics. That's all great because we all need to be physically involved as we grow. We also need to uh, exercise our minds and so this organization can serve that purpose initially to at least let them know that there's people out here that you can look up to to see that there's a place for you to go something you can gravitate to besides sports and if you add to it you know it kind of goes back to the mission of what we founded the whole organization on and that's basically giving back to our inner city youth uh, through programs resources services that are intended to empower them and make them the future leaders of those communities. So uh, what we're looking at is a mentorship program within each of the communities that we have with people like Merv and myself and Jack Jackson right. and people who are of significance within their own communities and have already kind of proven some way of, um, you know, being uh, established, so to speak. And so what they'll do through this is they'll go over through a mentorship forum, uh, speaking with the inner city youth and a group of no more than five is what we've kind of envisioned, okay. sitting down talking about their personal lives, sitting down talking about their career uh, objectives in life, uh, talking about their families and maybe getting into their spirituality purposes right. and then seeing uh, how it is from a business perspective. Maybe I'll invite one of them to be in on one of my business meetings and sit down and see how a business meeting is, uh, goes and how the communications exchange back and forth and how negotiations actually work without, you know, picking up a gun or wanting to fight someone and so forth. So right. those are the things that I think that, um, you know, kind of go back to the mission and where we're going to be with it. So being a role model. Mm -hmm. Right, and and being able to wear that cap, right? Yeah. So that, you know, Charles Barkley doesn't want to be anybody's role model, right? <laughs> no. No. It's easy to say, hey, I don't want to be a role model. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I don't want to. Don't right. don't, don't do what I yeah. do. Yeah. But it's another thing to say, hey, follow my lead. True. Yeah. You know, because that takes leadership. Right. It sounds like what you guys are trying to do. You're trying to take the bull by the horns and say, hey, let's let's get this thing right. Let's get people on the right track. Let's get people the right resources. Let's get people the right training. Let's mm -hmm. give them the right experiences. Right. And I think it would be really cool, and I don't know if this is already part of the plan. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a spiritual purpose there are certainly uh, involved. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I know there's, you're very purposeful spiritually. Absolutely, 100%. And I think that if you can unite people around, um, whether it's the spiritual element or whether it's even just the flag. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. can we get, the one thing that we all have forgotten that we can unite around yeah. Is the flag. We're all Americans. <coughs> we're, you know, I mean, you can say, well, we're all humans. We all have two eyes and two hands and, you know, or whatever. But we're all Americans. Right. If you can, we can unite around the flag. And that could be a point where um, we, we, teach, we can teach people how to, how to love one another because we're all under the same right. flag. The United well, States The of United, America. yeah. I feel like there's a lot of unity involved with what you're trying to accomplish here. Absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. I think, uh, Derek... Um, Derek and Derek. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it, right? that if you, if you get people to, to stand behind a common goal, then, then that, that's something that we all share. And, and making life better in America is all of our responsibilities. Agreed. So, so whether I do it initially for the for our inner city youth community, that benefits that community. That community benefits that, that, that city. That city benefits that state. That state benefits America, the nation. And if we start with small things, small groups certainly work and they're very, really powerful. You start things small, 
and, and then it grows from there. And I think I, I certainly agree with you that, that, that it's important for us to unite around a common theme. And if we can just make America the great theme with all the division that we see uh, in, in the last year of, 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 of politics, um, if we can just get people to come together on, on that common goal, that we all have the same uh, core values and the same core concerns uh, of making life better for all of us. Well, I, I'd love that day to, to be something that we were a part of starting mm -hmm. and seeing our, our nation move forward united. I think we, we certainly are better together than we are ind independently of each other. So. Absolutely. It's true. And we've made a lot of strides. You know, yeah. a lot has happened. Yep. Um, no question, the last 50, 60 <coughs> years made big, big, big strides. Mm -hmm. yeah. Still plenty of way ways to go. Right. And that's, and that's where we are now. We're, I think we're, we're waiting. You know, we've always had great leaders. Yeah. You know, um, we don't have a, a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. of right. this day mm -hmm. and age, you right. know, and maybe that's what, that's what we may be missing, you know, is something like that. But we've, made, we've come a long way. There's a long way still to go. So the work needs to be done by somebody. Yeah. And I'm really, really honored that you guys are doing this work. Yeah, because it's our honor to be a part of it. Yeah, for sure. cer certainly looking forward to what can happen with, with us putting our minds together and our, and our, our hands to the plow together to put something good together. And one thing also to mention is that, you know, within our organization, it's not just only military members that, or ex-military members. We're actually opening it up to, you know, just basically people of significance within the communities that want to give sure. back to those communities. Um, and I call it the seven mountains. You know, you know, we already have the government side taken care of with the military, ex-military. Right. Have the business side, uh, you know, with myself and Merv. But we also want people within the polit political side, uh, the media side, um, the education piece, and, and so on. Just everyone who can, you know, provide their own insight you know so that um, you know a, a person is well-rounded when they get this uh, what we say education experience or what would you say um, instead of we have a word called gestalt uh, meaning that I am not telling you what to do I'm just sharing my experiences with you right and you can make your own decision on which way you want to go because if I tell a kid hey this is what you need to do and it doesn't work out for them well then unfortunately they're gonna look back and say well I'll never work with the Eagles organization again but if they can glean from the experiences that we've had and more than likely they'll come up with the best solution for them yeah. themselves. Yeah, and I think that's what people need. People need to make their own decisions. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're going to make a lot of your own decisions. True. And so empowering people is about education. Yes. Yeah. And it's about having an, a good example. I mean, that's so, so important. We all yeah. know that little kids especially are just, uh, they're, they're copycats. You know, I mean, they, yeah. they just copy what they see. Repeaters. Yeah. That's exactly what they do. I mean, that's how we all grew up. We grew that's up right. just copying what we see. We didn't know anything else. Yeah. So if you can create something that's really positive mm -hmm. for people to copy, then now you've, you've automatically, without even trying to do anything, without even telling anyone this is what you should do, right. you've already created a, an environment for success, yeah. an environment that will be better than probably what was there before. Yeah. So I commend you both for doing this. It's fantastic stuff. Thank well, you. Exciting times. Exciting yeah, times. Exciting, exciting times. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you guys so much for being here. It's, it's good to be here. Thanks, Derek. Great right. stuff. Thanks. Stick around for more Smarter San Diego TV, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else. Commercial free. Hey, great show, guys. That's a wrap. Jade, uh, what's your schedule look like? Do you mind breaking down the set? Uh, not today, Derek. I'd love to, but there's waves out there. I gotta go. No, I can't either. I'm starting to get hangry and I have way too much stuff to do today. Kuru, you've got this right. Sure, guys. I would love to. I'll get right to work. <laughs>